I want to talk to you about this drug. This is an anti-malarial drug that was developed by the U.S. military about 40 years ago. If you haven't taken it yourself on overseas travel or in the military, you're probably familiar with it uh, from all of the media reports, uh, especially over the last decade. The drug has been linked in a number of media reports to suicides and acts of violence. And I think that there's been a lot of confusion and even misinformation about this association. So I hope to clarify some of this today. But I will preface this talk by saying the majority of this information I want to present at a special talk tomorrow morning at the 9 a.m., I believe in, in 226. So if, if I don't answer all of your questions on this today, I apologize. Uh, you're welcome to attend tomorrow's uh, lecture. Next slide, please. Just a few uh, brief uh, disclosures. I've uh, gone into consulting since I left the, uh, the military. I'm an epidemiologist and preventive medicine physician by training. Next slide, please. This is the original product insert for mefloquin or larium, which was marketed by F. Hoffman uh, LaRoche beginning in 1989. And you can see there are a number of very unusual things about this product insert. It's describing a number of symptoms which don't seem to belong in the product insert of a drug marketed for the prevention of malaria. Things like depression, anxiety, restlessness, and confusion being prodromal to this more serious event. Now I'm going to contend that this term, more serious event, is a euphemism which should have no place in a product insert. We want to try to figure out what this more serious event could refer to. Next slide, please. Well, we know what it could refer to from the epidemiology. Mefloquin is the only non-psychotropic drug listed in the top ten associated with acts of violence. This should be reason to pause. Next slide, please. There have been a number of case reports causally linking mefloquin to death, including suicides. Next slide, please. And one particular <laughs> suicide, I apologize for the, the, uh, the grisly uh, picture, but this has some unusual features, features of dissociation. There are some religious themes in, involved in, in this. Very impulsive and sudden and very unexpected and, and not associated with, with prior mental illness. Next slide. So my contention is, is that although we've traditionally thought of this drug as an anti-malarial medication. We really should think of it as a psychotropic medication with incidental anti-malarial properties. And, and why is this? Mefloquin as a, as a quinoline is, is very hydrophobic, very lipophilic. It accumulates uh, in organs, including the brain. And psychotropic effect, effects from the drug, if they occur, will typically occur within the first few doses. Often people will experience symptoms after the first dose. But even the drug manufacturer will concede that the most serious events will occur within the first four doses. It can occur even months later. But as an anti-malarial drug, its intended site of action is not in the organ tissues. It's in the circulation, because that's where the malaria parasites are. It's a schizonticide, which means it has to get into the erythrocytes uh, for it to exert its anti-malarial action. And only 1 to 2 percent of the drug, if you examine the pharmacokinetics, is actually found at that location in the erythrocytes. So where is the rest going? As a result of its very slow buildup in its desired compartment, it can take up to 7 to 10 weekly doses for it to become an effective anti-malarial drug. So I would contend that what we traditionally describe as neuropsychiatric side effects from the drug are actually symptoms of a highly conserved and prevalent syndrome of intoxication that will affect many of the users of the drug and many of those users of the drug will return home from their brief vacation having taken mefloquin, having never experienced effective schizonticidal properties from the drug. Next slide, please. Uh, I recommend anyone interested in, in this subject read this book. Ann Patchett is a, is a wonderful uh, author. She's uh, uh, been on the radio recently talking about this. Uh, and just a, a brief excerpt. I hope I'm not uh, violating copyright law by, by showing this. Larium is one of the main characters in this book. It keeps recurring, and, and the dreams and nightmares that the main character experiences uh, from mefloquine are central to the plot. And I think it's a very sensitive and, and vivid description of the effects of the mefloquine. Next slide, please. So this syndrome that I'm calling mefloquine intoxication uh, has already been described. It's described in the product insert. The drug manufacturer says if you experience anxiety, depression, restlessness, or confusion, these may be considered prodromal to a more serious event, in which case the drug must be discontinued. 
Now, I would argue that the, the clinical effects of the most serious forms of intoxication can mimic or even confound diagnosis of, of many of your DSM-4 and 5 conditions. But perhaps of greater public health concern are the significant subclinical effects of this intoxication, which include effects on dream content, sleep quality, mood cognition, personality, and behavior. And these effects we know epidemiologically can be associated with propensity to suicidality and violence. Next slide, please. I'm going to give you a, a few uh, papers here just to show you the, the prevalence and severity of these prodromal symptoms. So here's a, a study looking at soldiers given mefloquine versus a safer daily medication. And you can see the excess prevalence due to or incidence due to mefloquine is, is quite high. Nightmares, 31% excess incidence. Sleep disturbances, nearly 25%. Depression, concentration, difficulties. Not a benign drug in soldiers deploying overseas. Next slide, please. This is a complex slide, and I apologize. I think a lot of these results were intended to be obscured in, in this paper, but this is a, a failed trial of a supposedly safer version of mefloquine, and, and even this enantiomeric form was unable to eliminate uh, the changes on uh, mood uh, that was associated with the racemic uh, version. So not a benign medication, even if you're not experiencing, quote, side effects, even if you don't get diagnosed with a with an adverse reaction to the drug, you're going to experience prodromal symptoms from the drug. Next slide, please. Here's an early study that was done uh, around the time of its initial initial licensure, in which you can see that folks who are taking mefloquine suffer some very profound uh, insomnia, and and occasionally this is, is accompanied by uh, nightmares or, at the very least, very vivid dreams. Next slide, please. So insomnia is a very prominent symptom of mefloquine intoxication, as are these very terrifying nightmares in, in, in some users. And what's, what's quite tragic is this study uh, clearly showed this association between taking the drug um, and propensity to suicide. But of, unfortunately, these reactions, when they looked back at their history, they found some evidence of a mental health problem, or they found some way to attribute these reactions, not to the drug, but to something in the user's history. Next slide, please. And, and this has become the common misconception with mefloquine, that the misconception is that it's a safe drug unless you have a history of mental illness. The point with having a pre-existing mental illness is that if you have a history of anxiety or depression already, or are taking medications to control these symptoms, if you're taking mefloquine and you redevelop these symptoms, they may be familiar to you. And you may, be, you may be more likely to attribute these prodromal symptoms to your pre-existing diagnosis rather than to the toxic effects of the drug. Now, the drug insert clearly says if you experience these symptoms, you must stop taking the drug because they could be considered prodromal to a more serious event. But those with a history of mental illness may say, well, this is just my depression, and they may restart their medication. Or this might just be my anxiety, and so they restart their Valium. And that risks the development of a more serious event. Next slide, please. I'm going to go through this very quickly. We'll talk more about this tomorrow. But the military has unfortunately had a, a, an unfortunate history of prescribing this drug to precisely those individuals, individuals with contraindications to this medication. They exist in among 10% of those who are deployed to malarious areas. So, so one in 10 males, roughly one in five females deployed to malarious areas, our data shows, have some contraindication to mefloquine use, meaning they might confuse the prodromal symptoms for their pre-existing condition. Next slide, please. And, and we looked at prior prescriptions of psychotropic drugs and also prior ICD-9 diagnoses of mental disorders. Next slide, please. So mefloquine is difficult to use in at least the U.S. Army owing to the very high prevalence of these contraindicating conditions. Next slide, please. Another study I did uh, some years after I did that was to show, okay, of those with contraindications who had actually been erroneously prescribed mefloquine. And unfortunately, one in seven with contraindications that the U.S. military knew about were nonetheless prescribed the drug. So contrary to package insert guidance and contrary to military policy. And we don't know what the costs of this might have been. We don't know how many of these indiv individuals may have suffered a more serious event because we haven't yet done the proper long-term follow-up studies. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, I hope you appreciate that the key to using this drug in a more safe manner is in ensuring those users 
recognize the prodromal symptoms as being due to the drug's toxicity and then immediately discontinue the drug before a more serious event occurs. But the military has unfortunately contributed to this problem by misstating the prevalence or incidence of these problems. Here's a memo from 2009 that says psychiatric symptoms occur at a rate of 1 per 2,000 to 13,000 persons. So the average soldier will be of the opinion that side effects from this drug are exceedingly rare. And so it will be very difficult for soldiers in a tightly disciplined unit where use of the drug is under command supervision to discontinue the medication as the product insert requires. Next slide, please. And here is, unfortunately, one sailor who, who suffered precisely that fate because he did not recognize his prodromal symptoms. They were very subtle at first. Minor changes in mood that his wife picked up on immediately, but which he didn't appreciate. And the intoxication from mefloquin can progress very quickly. Just like alcohol intoxication makes it very difficult for you to know that you should not drive your car home, so too do the symptoms of mefloquin intoxication make it difficult for you to realize you need to stop taking your medication. So you must immediately recognize these symptoms and stop taking the drug. This uh, sailor did not, and he suffered what I deem a limbic encephalopathy, and ultimately a brainstem injury from the drug. This is how we detected it and were able to convince people of the severity of the syndrome, because he suffered brain and brainstem injury from this. I'm going to save most of this for tomorrow. Next slide, please. But mefloquine is a neurotoxin. In addition to having psychotropic effects, it can kill brain cells in the brain and brain stem. Next slide, please. And this is an effect that we've known about because it's common to all of these quinoline derivative drugs. Next slide, please. This is an effect that was first identified in the late 1940s. Next slide. And into the 1950s. Next slide. And this is something interesting. Next slide, please. This drug affects the EW nucleus, which those of you who are interested in the idiopathophysiology of PTSD, this should ring a bell in your minds. This is a very important part of the brainstem to control um, the pathophysiology of PTSD. So what I would contend is, is that what we're seeing from mefloquine, next slide, uh, please, these neuropsychiatric side effects that have been sort of vague and poorly described are not side effects, but symptoms of a prevalent and highly conserved idiosyncratic syndrome of mefloquine toxicity. And these prodromal symptoms can have a profound effect uh, on our uh, soldiers. And because these effects are known epidemiologically to be associated with suicidality and violent uh, ideation, we have plausibility. There's also this association with brain and brainstem neurotoxicity, which could explain some of the drug's uh, long-term effects. And what we see with mefloquine is nothing new. We've known about this from other quinoline drugs that the military has used ever since World War II. So if you're interested in this, I will stop now, but I'm going to have uh, more time tomorrow morning to talk about this in greater detail and also the drug's plausible roles in uh, some DSM-4 and 5 conditions. So thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it.